So we call God a lot of different names, don't we? In the Bible, God is called Lord, Father, Shepherd, Potter, Mother, Fortress, Rock, Strength, Redeemer, Alpha, Omega, the Ancient of Days, the Most High, the Everlasting, the Creator, the list goes on and on. The Quran contains 99 different names for God. And many faithful Muslims memorize the entire list. It includes things like the most merciful, the ever forgiving, the gentle one, the watchful. So it seems clear that no matter what religious tradition you are a part of, the idea of who God is is so mysterious and so beyond our understanding that one name alone won't do. Any time we use a word to name God, we're instantly struck with the idea that that name also doesn't quite do God justice. Sure, God is like a parent, but parent doesn't encompass all of how God loves us. Sure, God is like a king or a lord, but that royal language doesn't really capture the fullness of God's mercy. And yet we still try, we still try to make these names for God because we want a way to be able to speak to God the way we speak to a friend. We want to be able to address God at the beginning of our prayers. We want an image in our mind to capture who God is, to help us wrap our hearts around just who God is. And names are important. When somebody remembers your name, it feels good. It's a sign that you have a relationship, that you have a connection, they remember you, they know something about you. A name helps us to be in relationship. It's a way to connect. So I think that's what Moses was after. God appears to Moses in a burning bush and says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses' first question is, and who should I say that you are? Who should I tell them sent me? God doesn't seem too interested in that question because God's response is, I will be with you. Yes, Moses says, but who are you? If I come to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of our ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is God's name? What should I tell them? And God answers this time with a single Hebrew word. Well, word is a little bit of a stretch. It's four Hebrew consonants, roughly similar to the English letters Y-H-W-H. But it's a collection of letters that in Hebrew is impossible to pronounce. It would be like if God spelled God's name G-L-P-Q. How do you say that? The four letters of God's name are referred to by scholars as the tetragrammaton, which just means the four letters. But scholars like to have fancy words for things. In fact, in Jewish communities, when someone is reading along in the Hebrew scripture and they come to those four letters, what they would say out loud is, Adonai, which means Lord, or sometimes Hashem, which just means the name. The name is so holy and so sacred that people don't even try to pronounce it for 
fear that they might get it wrong or use it in vain. If you were to look at a Torah scroll, when you come across these four letters, they are interspersed with the vowels of the word Adonai. So it's one word inside the other. And that's just a reminder to anyone who is reading along that they're supposed to say Adonai instead of pronouncing the divine name. So this name of God is so revered, it's almost never spoken out loud, almost never written down unless it's for the purpose of prayer in reading or in worship. There was a Jewish seminary across the street from where I went to school in New York, and one of the things I noticed when I used to go and visit their campus is that there were separate trash cans every place where there was to discard garbage. Paper, plastic, trash, and geniza, which is a special place to dispose of any papers that have the name of God written on them or that have scripture written on them. As one rabbi at the seminary so eloquently put it, these papers bear the word and the name of God. We might not need them anymore, but we can't throw them out with yesterday's green bean casserole. So we have this name, this word that God gives as God's name for all generations and it's holy, and it's revered. It's almost never spoken. In fact, as it is, it's impossible to pronounce. And what does it mean? Well, there's no relief for us there either because the short answer is it's hard to say exactly. The translation that John just read says, I am who I am, which is pretty good. The King James Version that many of you might be familiar with says, I am that I am. Flipping through some other translations in my office, I found I am because I am, I will be what I will be, and my favorite, I am want to be what I am want to be. But you get the idea. Who are you, Moses asks. I am who I am. Now, I don't know if that's the best answer. Probably not quite what Moses was looking for. Not going to inspire too much confidence if anyone actually does ask Moses who this God is who sent him. But I think there's something really important captured in the fact that God's name is an unpronounceable word with a meaning that is nearly impossible to understand. I think God wants us to remember that no name could be everything. That none of us, none of us ever will fully wrap our minds around who or what God is. We can't understand it fully. It's like a word that's impossible to pronounce. It's always just a little further away. God is who God is. God is so unlike everything else that we know that nothing compares. No concept that you or I could hold in our head would ever be an accurate image of the fullness of God. God just is who God is. And if you happen to find that to be an unsatisfactory answer to the question of who God is, you're not alone. Moses wasn't thrilled with the answer either. If we keep reading in Exodus, he keeps asking questions. He keeps second-guessing God. He keeps asking that someone else might get sent to confront the Pharaoh and not him. And surely the history of the church is also full of a lot of very smart people who have spent a lot of time and energy trying to get a precise idea of exactly who God is, exactly what God is like, 
into the words of a creed or a prayer. But at the end of the day, God is who God is. But I want to just look back and look back at the way that God answered the question the first time before Moses got insistent asking for a name. The first time Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Not a name, but a promise. I will be with you. That is the answer that it seems to me that God most wanted to give, the one that God most wanted Moses to hear. I will be with you. I have to say that one of the most difficult parts about being a person of faith for me is being confronted with the reality of suffering in our world. I know that like many of you, I watched floodwaters rise in Houston this week, people trapped in sinking cars and stranded on rooftops. And I can never escape the idea when I'm seeing these things or reading about these things that I'm gonna have to put on this robe and stand up here in front of you and I kind of feel like I should have an answer for it all. Like I should be able to say why it happened or articulate some precise notion about who God is that at once holds everything that I believe to be true. But the truth is that I can't. And when I try, it just ends up like something I can't quite pronounce or something I I don't quite know what it means. And so I rely on God's first answer, the first thing God wanted to say to Moses, I will be with you. Because that I feel like I can say without a doubt. Because like many of you, I also watched an abundance of generosity and goodwill that rose faster than the flood. I saw neighbors helping people they never knew, TV crews putting down cameras to help people in trouble, furniture stores opening up to give people a comfortable place to sleep. God brought to life in human hearts the sort of love and feeling of solidarity that might have been previously unimaginable. Some of you might know that my best friend is a pastor in Houston. And this morning, he's preaching to his congregation, many of whom lost everything. And they're reading from Exodus 2. And I got an advanced copy. (laughs) I just wanted to share with you a a few words of how he, um, Nathan Bledsoe, um, how he, Nathan ends his sermon. He writes, the people of this city and this whole region are in the wilderness. The pain that brought us here was not something that God wanted for us, but God has not left us in the midst of it all. And you don't have to look far to see that some things are being brought to fullness in the love and life of people, in the ways that they are showing each other hope. God is good and God's children are so incredible. Maybe he's saying those words at this very moment. (laughs) 
look, we can't know everything there is to know about God. Our minds cannot expand wide enough to wrap around the divine identity. Our hearts cannot even love deeply enough to fathom the depths of God's love. And as we, as a community together, face into a broken and a hurting world, torn not just by natural disasters, but by disasters of our own making to poverty, violence, and war, we may not always be able to say with certainty and clarity exactly who or what God is in the midst of it all. But we can say this with complete confidence. God will be with us. God will be with all people, now and always.